going to run in the order presented in the program. Andrew is first up. The floor is yours. Uh, are we going to hold the questions off until the very end or after are, each presentation? Well, I think let's hold them off until the end. And that way we know that we'll get through this. So you've got sort of 18 minutes. You've each sort of got 18 minutes and then we'll um, hold the questions at the end, particularly um, as people pop in and join the session, if that might make more sense. Okay. All right, I'm just uh, sharing the screen now. If you can't see it, just let me know. Um, okay, so uh, thanks a lot, Sheila, for, for chairing and uh, for, for putting this session together. This is really, if I'm going to summarize what I'm going to talk about here, all of this is in the context of what I would call a very important and historic dispute that resulted in a lockout of about 750 workers at the co-op refinery in Regina, Saskatchewan. And it's all in the context of changes taking place uh, within FCL, but specifically the, the refinery complex and how I would argue this has transformed in many respects, the, the tenor, the outcome, and really the trajectory of, of labor relations on a day-to-day -day basis, but also really helped to shape what became this historic dispute in uh, the capital city. And if we're gonna summarize who's involved here, there's really two lead actors. One would be the co-op refinery complex, uh, North America's really only, and, and one of the most important in Canada, uh, cooperatively owned refineries, as well as Unifor Local 594. And for clarification, Unifor Local 594 is really a, a big tent. Uh, all trades, all industries, local at the refinery from skilled uh, building trades to those in administrative support, process operators, the entire spectrum of uh, support staff involved with the refining process and a lot of the management of that facility. So it's white collar, blue collar and building trades workers. Certainly a very classic industrial union. If we're looking at this uh, from a timeline, uh, I start here in 2016. I'm not gonna go through that round of bargaining, but that round of bargaining, and in fact, if we push it back a bit further, 2014, 15, when things got off the ground, is really the, the starting point for what eventually led to the lockout in December of 2019. And the focus in 2016 at the time uh, was really looking at massive changes and concessions at the bargaining table focused on, on pensions. And it resulted, yes, in a, a threat of a lockout, preparation by the company to uh, employ replacement workers. Uh, there was a strike vote. There was, no, um, there was no dispute or work stoppage at the time. And the union itself, uh, the membership voted in favor of a two-tier pension system with a defined contribution model for new employees. Um, after that, really kind of brushing off the dust, Local 594 starts prepping for the next step. And 2018, we see the, the process and really round two, I would argue, of the same fight. And there was a very serious uh, communications and PR campaign, I would argue, going on both sides. Community building exercise uh, within the ranks of Local 594. Um, bargaining commences, there's an impasse, and by fall, early winter of, of 2019, a strike very quickly turns into a lockout that has just recently been settled. And things get really dicey very quickly, uh, threats and then the imposition of court injunctions, picket lines turn into full blockades. Uh, threats of violence, uh, bomb threats, uh, intervention of the government, uh, arrest of union leaders, special arbitration, and then finally, just recently, an agreement is reached. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I'll say that I, I started this research uh, through a consulting project uh, that was commissioned by Local 594 with the interest of looking at their economic and social impact in the community, as well as in Southern Saskatchewan. Uh, I also got to 
uh, receive a, a, a front row seat to this dispute by way of being a city councilor in Regina. So I, I, I saw what was taking place behind the scenes, the correspondence from managers, industry, workers, um, things that typically would not be witnessed uh, by members of the public or, or researchers. So I'm, I'm going to really focus on a narrow spectrum of what's going on here, but I, I, there will be some editorializing just based on what I, I witnessed from a decision maker standpoint. Um, and again, this, is, this was a long battle that one might argue started in 2010 with the change of leadership at FCL, uh, Federated Cooperative Limited, which is kind of the, the parent co-op, if you will, that, that oversees all the different cooperative enterprises, just to summarize, uh, of which the refinery is a part. Um, we're, if we're gonna look at its significance in terms of what was demanded and how the negotiations unfolded, questions over scope issues, uh, concerns over outsourcing and subcontracting, uh, benefit plans, savings plans, pensions really at the heart of it. We also see the complex role of the state courts and specifically police, uh, a complex and contradictory role of all of these different agencies. And as the title of the talk suggests, um, a change in management, management philosophies, and I would argue a departure from cooperative principles in terms of how they're executed and what they mean on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the management of, um, of, of, the, of the refinery specifically. And this is important because it, it results in a change of decades of arguably peaceful collective bargaining relations uh, and then turns into a, a very protracted dispute that one would argue was aimed not just about achieving concessions, but of, of breaking the union. Um, now, what is corporatization in this context? Well, I, I'm really going to deal with that on the side of my desk, but I would argue it's a, a, a set of practices about how wealth is accumulated and distributed. It translates into uh, adopting principles and practices and management philosophies that we might see in large, typically private uh, and multinational oil corporations and a deviation from principles of, of cooperation that had in some respects defined labor relations historically. And really the, the lauding and, and supporting of market-based logic of profit and efficiency over other principles that we might assume to be part of how a cooperative functions and how it develops a business plan. Um, and in this context specifically, it meant extracting concessions at a time of record profit. So we might often associate uh, concessionary bargaining with austerity, cutbacks, et cetera, certainly in the, in, the, in the public sector. Here we're seeing an astronomical growth of rates of return, uh, profitability, and at the same time looking to extract concessions from the bargaining unit. Um, Three principal arguments really guiding this. One is, as I suggested, the fundamentals of cooperative principles really exchange for practices that align with those of competitors owned and operated by major oil interests in Canada and uh, globally. Second, that the union's adherence to cooperative and conciliatory bargaining really left it ill-equipped to confront, either in the workplace or in the public sphere, management's uh, cost-cutting and anti-labor agenda. And finally, that there is a marked tension between community unionism and the circumstances in which the legal industrial action is ineffective and where civil disobedience about union revitalization in this context, community unionism, I think as part of the repertoire of, of the strategy of, of confronting concessionary bargaining, uh, civil disobedience and illegality kind of need to be back on, on the agenda. I'm not going to go through the details of, of the, the, the specifics of the study, but it started with a, a survey consisting of some 60 branching questions with the local 594 members around volunteerism, attitudes towards unions, employer attitudes, uh, perception of occupational health and safety. Uh, from there, we got about 351 responses or 40% of the membership. I, from there, built a catalog of potential interviewees that were representative by gender and occupation. And uh, a lot of what I draw from the insights, at least, are uh, stemming from, from those interviews uh, with workers. Also, I'm going to be drawing from uh, findings from FOI material media uh, 
corporate reports, union newsletters, and other uh, primary sources. So what's important about this dispute and the, and the employer? Well, the refinery itself is formed in the 1930s by farmers who were disenfranchised like many others with Eastern and foreign interests that were dominating the oil industry. Cooperative principles really ingrained in the constitution of certainly Prairie provinces, but specifically uh, Saskatchewan. We see the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, socialist in its early iterations here on the right, a picture of uh, Tommy Douglas David in the 1950s a large event at the, at the co-op refinery. So the notion of cooperation, of cooperatives, uh, really a pillar of, of Saskatchewan's uh, history and the legacy. And this is important because it helps to shape the public narrative that even today FCL, the parent organization and the refinery itself adhere to, we're different. We believe in these values. We distribute wealth to uh, you know, those who are, are paying into the system, but it very much is something that uses cooperation as a brand. But even as early as its formation, uh, organizing quickly took root. And so even though it was a cooperative, cooperative labor relations in the province were always tense. On the left here, a picture of uh, Neil Reimer, who really helped to define unionism in uh, Canada's refineries in the oil industry. And he was a you know, farm kid from Saskatchewan, starts organizing. It was an uncontested uh, uh, certification process. And what became 594 was actually the nesting place of a lot of radical ideas about the future of oil work and oil workers. And even in cooperatives, uh, the need for proper labor relations and strong unions, various iterations of those representing these workers, like the Oil Workers International Union, eventually becomes a CEP over time, eventually Unifor in a merger in 2013. And I think if we come to today, the, the, the words of one retired process operator resonated with me and they really seemed to go out of their way, he said, uh, to get you down, to break you. I think that was the idea, to break you. So the, the tenor of a lot of the, the conversations and interviews I had with these workers was very much a complete breakdown and a betrayal uh, by their employer of cooperative principles that are ingrained in their collective agreement. What's also important about looking uh, at, at the refinery union history that stems from the co-op refinery is that it sets down a path workers with a unique and independent perspective over the oil industry. Uh, unions were talking about environmentalism. They were talking about public ownership. Uh, they were talking about worker control. They were fighting automation. Um, and what's important here is that where we kind of end up in the oil industry is one where workers' interests are seemingly aligned in this new common sense with the employer, which I'll talk about later. So the importance here is that there had always been an element of, of militancy and independent policy oversight and policy formation in the ranks of uh, oil workers, and partly due to the work and the agitation that had stemmed out of the organizers at the co-op refinery complex here in Saskatchewan. And this kind of brings us to a, a broader context of the petrol state. Uh, Bill Carroll talks about the carbon capital as concentration and, and shifting of financial and economic interests in Western Canada, specifically Calgary, dominated by oil industry and oil industry interests. Stuart True calls it a form of pipeline populism in which, uh, again, this new common sense is one in which we're all in this together and we align our interests as a society, as an economy, uh, and certainly politically with the interests of the industry. And there is this new common sense that emerges. And again, a betrayal of this history of workers and unions trying to forge their own path. Former Premier Brad Wall called uh, really this, this debate over whether or not we should have pipelines a risk to national unity, obviously targeting uh, Eastern Canadian political interests and Trudeau specifically but we're all in this together. And this resonated uh, significantly in this dispute because all of a sudden you have oil workers, the cherished laborers of uh, prairie capitalism and the petrol state defying an industry at time of record profits. Uh, certainly they had to forge a path into sustainability, but petrol politics, petrol politics are such that we all gravitate towards and define the political geography about our economic relationship with oil. And what's interesting is very quickly we see these contradictions. So if you imagine principles of, of cooperation, of mutual aid, uh, 
uh, ensuring that those paying into the system, farmers and others get their share of the wealth. Well, you also see the CEO of FCL um, and leaders at the refinery meeting with far right uh, yellow vest movement, United We Roll, uh, some, you know, one would argue neo-fascist kind of organizers threatening with violence, uh, protesters and anybody who would disrupt the interests of the oil industry, truckers, um, and uh, certainly anything that would jeopardize the well-being in small communities. So, the contradiction here is we love oil workers, except when they fight back. We love oil workers uh, when they fight against concessions. We love oil workers unless they're trying to demand more from the industry, which is incredibly profitable, despite the narrative that we're all uh, suffering hardship. Um, and I think this was something that was quite a shock to the workers themselves who felt betrayed by these principles uh, that they believed that they were working towards to protect and advance over, over decades. And this is really where corporate interests uh, are sold as cooperative interests and values to the general public. And it created a great deal of physical tension in the community and, and political rifts and political rifts in the, in the labor movement as well. But again, we see far right allies being summoned by the cooperative refinery to help fight off uh, Unifor, which was casted as, as an Eastern Union. And another set of contradictions here is really highlighted by uh, the CRC in its former uh, uh, dispute with the workers in, the, in, a, in 2016. New pipelines are putting pressure on the cost of our crude supply. As one worker said in an interview, for us, we buy it cheap from you, but we can still make the same item at the end of the day. So the, the, the actual limits and the lack of market for a lot of Western Canadian crude was creating conditions for mega profits at the refinery. So what, again, the contradiction here is we have to get behind pipelines, we have to find markets. Uh, the contradiction for the capital city of Saskatchewan for this refinery is actually, we would undermine our own interests by pursuing new pipelines and getting that fuel to market. We buy it at an incredible discount. And again, the workers were aware of this and saying the, the, the fewer pipelines that are constructed and the lower the rate for Western Canadian crude prices, the better we are today. And that's likely something that's going to be sustained into the future. And for context, about 86% of FCL uh, net income comes from the revenue and the wealth generated by the refinery itself. So some of these workers actually identified themselves as keeping FCL and the cooperative system, certainly in Western Canada, afloat uh, because of what they describe as the job of, of boiling oil. Um, and one worker very sensationally called this the house of hatred. And what was striking was they would use the terms, the corporatization of the co-op, of the refinery, um, in terms of the day-to-day -day labor relations, disregard for occupational health and safety, the limits of self-regulation. Here we see the aftermath of um, actually two, two significant explosions that uh, seriously injured dozens in 2011, 2013. And this was really uh, emblematic of what these workers thought was their entitlement, which was this is the work we do. These are the conditions under which we labor. We have many rank and file brothers and sisters who have nearly lost their lives. It's a just reward that we should get a defined benefit. And these are some of the principles that of cooperation that we should all be rallying against. And instead of using this as a, a mechanism to really improve health and safety or take a new narrative about how we need to regulate these kind of manufacturing spaces, it was actually used by FCL as a public relations campaign. And so it was about monitoring public opinion about the refinery. We see it supporting through uh, uh, really just investments in the community, uh, Globe Theater, community events, organizations, and even finances the city's emergency notification system. So it wasn't a radical change in how they dealt with occupational safety on the, on the ground floor. The FCL simply responds by dealing with this through a public relations initiative. And that is something that starts in 2013 and maintains itself throughout the lockout. And in some respects, if we read Banda's own accounts and the leadership of the company, it was a blame the, the lower level management and blame the workers' attitudes. People doing routine jobs, not enough foresight, not enough accountability, not enough attention to risk management. And these were attitudes that he was explicitly trying to break, to change. And part of that meant confronting the union, which had uh, it, 
according to the company, really been responsible for dragging down productivity, efficiency, and returns on investment. So it was a, a, an orchestrated top-down centralization of, of, of power and influence in FCL to a point where it was no longer an independent entity, the refinery within uh, FCL, but something that had to be controlled and, and, and reined in. And in this context, we see workers loving their jobs if we're looking at uh, data achieved through some of these surveys. 78% uh, for instance say they love their job at the refinery but just 31% say they res were respected by their em em employer. So there's this gradual erosion over time to a point where people felt like there wasn't a place that they even wanted to work and were willing to take less than they might in other workplaces because they believed in the principles of the, of the co-op as consumers as well as workers. So what does this mean? Well it's in this context that the, the union sets down a path of union revitalization and I think we should question to what extent is community unionism and revitalization feasible in the oil patch, which is often defined by a very uh, rugged sense of, of independence, uh, unsafe workplaces, uh, actually quite precarious in terms of how it's tethered to co global commodity prices. To what extent can unions like this ally with environmental movements, with uh, community organizations, as Steve Tufts outlines, coalitions between unions and non-labor groups in order to achieve common goals, or in other uh, literature, organizing workers on the basis of common non-workplace identities, interests of place, and so on. And to say it in another way, how can a union that was very insular and focused on its workplace and actually not speaking out against uh, infractions and occupational health and safety risks at the workplace, how does it then kind of break out of this insularity and summon uh, influence uh, for the purposes of wielding that power in the labor relations context. How could it use revitalization and community uh, unionism as a way of becoming more influential in the bargaining sphere, but also in uh, the community at large and in, in the political terrain that defines this city? And this was really the path that we were talking about in the study. And to what extent is it possible? And it's from there that they started to engage and reflect on and, and ask themselves about volunteerism and where they should be in the future, not just in the short term in terms of how this could wield leverage at the bargaining table, but how can they redefine unionism? And it became a, an exercise of advertisements, PR, uh, the trades workers actually working as volunteers to replace boilers, uh, being members of the community, showcasing that they were elected officials, they were coaches, they supported uh, through their own incomes, local economies. They were farmers. Uh, they lived in rural Saskatchewan. They had a, a multitude of hats. And they started to define themselves as really being embedded in the community and regretting the years of, of staying silent on, on the conditions of, of work and things that had been looked the other way historically. And so what we're trying to figure out here in this uh, analysis is what would it look like? Well, one, they found that principles of cooperation were huge amongst the membership, that they needed to define a sense of, of, of community as important to themselves as cooperative workers. Um, importantly, they wanted to redefine what it meant to be political because many of them identified as, as conservative voters. You couldn't define political engagement simply by measure of who you voted for, but instead engagement in the community in different ways. And so this was something we kind of deduced in terms of how it would be possible to have a community union or revitalization strategy in the oil patch is to, to have their own independent assessment of what it would mean to be politically engaged and ultimately become stewards of that cooperative brand and those values in the province. One thing that kind of fell short, didn't really get achieved, uh, and certainly in time was there was a failure to engage seriously with other unions. Uh, not long before there had been a strike of, amongst those pumping gas at the gas stations and co-op, uh, same kind of struggle. Uh, but they identified the need to form stronger bonds of solidarity with other locals throughout the value chain, specifically the formation of unity councils, and to politicize cooperative governance. This, this effort kind of fell flat, if only because there was not a, enough time before the, the dispute had turned into a full-out work, work stoppage. And most importantly, uh, they need to be bec become advocates for broader social and political issues like occupational health and safety and the environmental question in Saskatchewan. Uh, 
So if we were to define what's the possibility of union revitalization and community unionism, these are some of the, uh, the chief points that they identified and we identified as, as they were working on this. And some of this language came through during the boycotts and the call for a national solidarity campaign. Um, about time to wrap up, Andrew. Yeah, and just to conclude then, part of this also asks uh, what role for civil disobedience? So here we were, we were struggling with, and this really did play out, when you're trying to build solidarity and support in a community, where does breaking the law fit in? Where does breaking the law fit in when it's been identified that the employer really has no interest in conceding unless it achieves all of its objectives? Um, how do you achieve these gains when the right to picket, the right to strike, and other actually um, secured rights are defied and uh, where unions are actually deprived of the capacity to impact the bottom line of that corporation. And it really suggests the limits of the judicialization of, of class struggle in this rights-based approach to one in which civil disobedience needs to be part of a revitalization and community unionism strategy, if only to endure the, the kind of negative backlash, but also to figure out that there are limits to that liberal rights-based narrative in terms of making gains and securing strength at the bargaining table obviously all in the context of a very divided house of labor that had purged uniform from its ranks. I'll leave it at that and uh, hopefully we can talk about this in the Q&A. Great, thanks very much Andrew. I'm going to turn it over now to Charles. Charles speaking on socialism and the Saskatchewan Trade Union Act, gender and politics in the construction of industrial legality in a prairie province 1944 to 1948. Over to you Charles. Hi, sorry about that. My, I was having some trouble with this thing. Um, well, thanks for that. I mean, in some ways, this kind of flows uh, in some ways out of what Andrew was saying. I should point out that Andrew and I, since he was giving full disclosure, I'll do the same. Uh, this research comes out of a book that we are working on uh, around the formation and the sort of politics of the Trade Union Act here in Saskatchewan. And one of the questions that you know we sort of started with, and I'm going to share my screen here, and I will give you uh, some pictures, not very many, but a couple. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, I will do that. There. Uh, and the idea for us was, okay, what's interesting about uh, Saskatchewan is one. Two, what's interesting about the trade union that constructed by the CCF in Saskatchewan in 1944, and why does it matter in 2020? And we came to a series of conclusions uh, in, in that this is interesting because one, it's the only act in existence in Canada, in North America really, that was constructed by uh, a left of center political party. Uh, when you look at the literature of industrial legality of the formation of collective bargaining legislation in both Canada and the United States, Obviously it's different in Europe, but when you look at it in North America, what you see is a tendency among scholars to really see uh, the limits of industrial legality, either by the Democratic Party in the 1930s or by the Liberal Party at the federal level during the Second World War, or during the various uh, provinces governed by liberals or conservatives, that they were never willing to concede the things that labor wanted. Uh, whereas Saskatchewan remains the only jurisdiction where a government solely, you know, a government that was committed to, in, you know, increasing the rights to expanding the rights of organized labor formed government in this sort of crucial moment in uh, labor history. And for us, that's interesting. And it's interesting because it raises a series of questions. You know, what's unique about the CCF's Trade Union Act that's different than uh, the other jurisdictions in the country? Why has it received so little scholarly attention, uh, etc.? So the, the election of the Douglas CCF in 1944, uh, you know, really is a turning point for understanding the sort of the formation of what, what, what I would call a pro-labor or a labor-friendly uh, for, you know, industrial model that is, you know, sort of at its center is designed to help workers as opposed to, uh, you know, sort of forcing government to, to do something that it otherwise wouldn't have done, which I think is how we would characterize uh, 
the construction of PC-1003 by the King government at the same period. So the act itself has become a central component of Saskatchewan's history. It was the first province to recognize the bona fide right, and I emphasize that concept of bona fide right uh, of um, workers to collectively bargain in this province. Um, it was the first government to outlaw company unions, and I'm going to get into that in a second. Uh, it was the first government to allow public sector workers to organize under uh, the Trade Union Act. Um, and it's the first government to recognize the bona fide rights of workers to organize. So this is interesting, and it's surprising that it's received so little, little scholarly attention. And I think that's probably true for a couple of reasons. One, the act was passed at the same time as the federal government introduced PC-1003. So the federal government's concession on PC-1003 is t it tends to be where most scholars sort of highlight their analysis and look at the King government's wartime regulations, which then trickles into the provinces by 1948 uh, and clearly by 1950. Um, not many people though could probably tell you the differences between the two acts. And I think those differences are interesting to think about. There's also lots of contradictions in them, which I'll get into as well. Um, but this lack of attention, I think, happens for a couple of reasons. Um, and then it raises a series of questions. So one of them is that it's Saskatchewan, right? So Saskatchewan is a small province, uh, you know, with very few uh, members of the industrial working class. Uh, in 1944, perhaps a little different now, but not, a, not radically different, is that um, by 1944, we're talking about a really an agricultural-based economy, not an industrial one. And that... Saskatchewan was one of the few provinces during the war that had almost no uh, wartime production. Um, it was really the breadbasket of uh, the wartime economy and less so about producing stuff. The big industrial workers were rain, trail, sorry, um, railway workers uh, and meat packers. Those were the two big um, sort of industrial productive um, um, you know, workers in the province. So that's one of the reasons. Two is that it was governed by the CCF, and that's an interesting component that too often I think gets overlooked. So it raised some interesting questions for us. Was the CCF government a party that identified as socialist? Was it radically different than the federal Liberal Party with regards to labor policy? Um, and interestingly, throughout the 1930s and 40s, labor socialists, which is what um, uh, certain new, new recent scholarship has sort of identified as uh, not communist, uh, but not social democratic. Uh, so Jim Naylor's book on labor socialism really looks at how a group of um, you know, organizers within the CCF pushed for an aggressive form of socialism that was not communist, uh, but not reformist in the traditional social democratic way. How did they warm to some form of industrial legality to promote the rights of labor and to offset the power of capital? Because you know, the, the communist party and the communist activists were really suspicious of any kind of state reforms uh, they thought it demobilized uh, workers and it demobilized labor militancy. Why did the CCF see the law as the best way forward to promote the rights of workers? And what did that law look like? Uh, you know, what made, and this is a question at the center of our book, uh, what made the Saskatchewan CCF's labor code so-called socialist? What was socialist about it? What was different about it than the reform package passed by King uh, and, you know, the premiers in, um, you know, Ontario and Quebec and, and so forth? Um, and as much as the code was designed as a model for CCF parties in other provinces and in Ottawa, and that's something I'm going to get into as well, and that the Saskatchewan Trade Union Act uh, is in many ways not meant for Saskatchewan. It's meant to be the model Trade Union Act that the CCF will introduce if it forms government, uh, which of course never does, uh, at the federal level or in Ontario, which was of course the big prize for um, the CCF in 1944. Uh, why did the Saskatchewan CCF feel the need to bring in a far-reaching labor code to begin with, given that it was largely an agricultural community uh, with a relatively small working class, which I've already mentioned? Two, why did the Saskatchewan CCF's labor code offer, what did it offer to workers that couldn't be offered to workers by the other parties? Um, you know, why was it seen as this uh, broad model and what was specific about Saskatchewan? And as I'll show you, there's not really anything specific to Saskatchewan about this, this, this act. What does the code tell us about the left, in particular, the relation between socialists and trade unions? Uh, what does it tell us about the uh, gender and the construction of industrial legality, which is something that is uh, relatively unexplored? Uh, Judy Fudge and Eric Tucker have done a little bit of that, but not, not a lot. Uh, 
And what might this history tell us about the next generation of labor political activism that would produce a similar far reaching labor code uh, or not uh, designed to address today's workplace challenges? So uh, those are some of the big questions at the heart of our research. <clears throat> Hopefully our book will start answering some of that. Um, but this early research, and I've been doing it for about a year now, I've been digging in the archives at the federal and, uh, and provincial levels, uh, going through it and trying to sort of get a sense of how did the bill come to be, what was in it, uh, and what were some of the tensions and contradictions in the, in the construction of this, of this thing. So let me go through some of that. So uh, it's not news to anyone here, uh, you'll all know this, but the CCF is elected in the late spring of 1944 in Saskatchewan, it's the first major breakthrough for the Social Democratic or the Socialist Party uh, that had been born in the 1930s. It had never been elected anywhere else. They'd won a few seats in Winnipeg, a few seats in Vancouver, a few seats in Saskatchewan, uh, a few seats in Toronto and Ontario. Uh, but by 1944, it looked like the CCF was on the verge of some major breakthroughs. And Saskatchewan, many thought at the time, was the sort of uh, the first of many victories to come. And one of the big questions for the party brass uh, at that point, and you know, here you could look at people like Douglas, but also David Lewis, uh, Andrew Bruin, Ted Jolliffe, uh, and of course the BC section. Many were asking, well, how can the Saskatchewan victory help propel victories uh, to other jurisdictions, including Ontario, BC, and, and federally? So what Douglas was doing was being watched really closely by everyone in the party across the country which suggested that the party at the national level had its fingers in a lot of the things that Douglas was doing. And this produced a lot of tension between the local people here in Saskatchewan and the federal party because the, so the local people were concerned that too much federal interference would look poorly on them uh, and could, you know, could end up you know, causing a lot of problems because it could be seen as being controlled by Ottawa, which of course the CCF is never keen to do. So this tension is particularly uh, important for the CCF because the relationship with the labor movement had always been tenuous. So layer on the tension between regionalism, layer on the tension within the party, now you've got this tension with the labor movement who is pushing the Saskatchewan CCF uh, to do something for labor that can then be used as a model for elsewhere. And um, this proves tenuous. Uh, one of the CCF's growth plans was to see greater uh, affiliations with the CCL, uh, the Canadian Congress of Labour, before it became the CLC. Uh, the CCF was convinced that if the CCL could align with the CCF, that they could create a sort of working class coalition that could lead them to electoral victory. Uh, so the Trade Union Act was designed as a tool by the Saskatchewan CCF in combination with the national CCF to build an alliance with the CCL unions, particularly in Ontario, to try and sort of build that model, which incidentally was being criticized heavily by uh, the liberal, the bourgeois liberal parties and the bourgeois press here in Saskatchewan as, you know, being accusing the CCF of using Saskatchewan as a guinea pig for a socialist experiment. And that's not me exaggerating. That's the language they actually use to criticize Douglas and, and the others. When we look at the act itself, uh, in many ways, it's very similar to the National Labor Relations, the National Labor Relations Act passed by uh, the FDR administration in the United States, or the so-called Wagner uh, Act. Um, Douglas's government drafted a bill that adopted most of the provisions of that National Labor Relations Act in the U.S. Uh, and, you know, borrowed some of the language from the Privy Council Order 1003 that was passed in 1944. But there were actually some key differences, and these are, I think, worth pointing out. One of the major differences in Douglas's bill that made it stand out was that it allowed public sector workers to both unionize and to strike. That had never been done before. And to put that in perspective, those same rights would not be granted to federal public servants until 1967, and only after a prolonged strike by the postal workers. And in some places like Ontario, those rights were not enshrined in the trading or their equivalent of the Trading Act until the 1980s. So, I mean, this is a far reaching reform that, um, you know, Canadian governments uh, had long resisted, you know, the honor of the crown and all that nonsense. But that was sort of part of the res resistance. That's not true in Saskatchewan. But there's also some really interesting uh, additions in that 44 bill that um, might be news to some of you. So here's how it came about. So the bill is constructed not by the Douglas cabinet. Here amongst uh, you know, that first 
uh, September until December sitting of the legislature, the Douglas government introduces the, uh, you know, the amount of reform that's probably never been uh, done anywhere else, you know, over a hundred different bills, modernizing the Saskatchewan state. Uh, and most of that legislation dealt with farms and, you know, property and, you know, protecting family farms, uh, you know, updating uh, a lot of sort of uh, the, you know, the, really bringing this the Saskatchewan state into the 1940s because it was stuck in the 1910s by that point. But on this one issue, they allow the federal party to really lead the way. So it's not constructed, the bill is not constructed by local folk, it's constructed by the national party. And they bring two people in to draft this bill in the summer of 1944, a guy named Andrew Bruin uh, and a guy named Ted Jolliffe. And Bruin is the president of the Ontario CCF and Jolliffe is soon to become the, the leader of the Ontario CCF. So really, this is a bill designed by and for, um, well, obviously industrial workers, but to be something to give to the Ontario section of the party, a model labor relations act. And of course, as is true with all things CCF, NDP at this time, David Lewis has his you know, hands in, you know, in all of this, as do the leaders of the CCL, guys like Pat Conroy and Aaron Mosher, who are clearly sort of guiding this bill to be a model um, for, for the rest of the country. So Bruin and Jolliffe are labor lawyers, also very active in the CCF, as I suggested. Lewis is particularly keen on building the electoral relationship with organized labor. The Trade Union Act is designed uh, to do that. And to give you a sense of that, I do have a couple slides, not as many as Andrew, but um, um, I wanna introduce you to a guy named Labor Louie. <clears throat> Now, I find cartoons fun and interesting, but it was interesting to me that I found this in the National Archives, stuck in the Douglas Papers in the CCF. And one of the things that became clear is that you know, what, what was good for Saskatchewan workers was going to be good for all the workers. And uh, the Labour Louis campaign was something both constructed by the CCL uh, and by the CCF in the 1948 uh, Douglas reelect and in the election that was meant to come at the federal level and the election coming in Ontario after the war. And what's interesting is you see that the party is very clearly looking at this quintessential worker, you know, male industrial working class worker who, you know, in those days people didn't travel a lot, right? So you didn't probably see a lot of the country, but Labour Louie decides uh, to travel the country uh, being from Saskatchewan to see what's going on in other parts of Canada. And you can see that in that upper right hand corner. And he goes to Alberta where he finds the minimum wage is terrible. He goes to British Columbia where he sees right wing governments clawing back labor rights. He goes to Prince Edward Island, which had passed some really re you know, restrictive labor legislation meant to undo the gains of the, of the post war of the war period. He goes to Quebec and he's reminded that, you know, trade unions get locked up. <clears throat> He goes to Ontario and he realizes that, you know, life is pretty bad for a lot of workers, including uh, retail workers who don't make, you know, decent minimum wage. Um, you know, and you can really see the gender dynamics at play in this cartoon. Um, you know, Manitoba is equally doing poorly. But in Saskatchewan, Labour Louie is doing really well. In Saskatchewan, we've got certified unions, we've got bargaining, we've got, you know, hospitalization and medical insurance. There's two weeks vacation with pay that Douglas government introduced. There's a minimum wage. Uh, and even though the CCF campaigned on a 40 hour work week in 1944, they never brought that in. But a 44 hour work week was the compromise. A lot of labor people in Saskatchewan were not really happy with that, but it was certainly better than what was happening at the federal level. Uh, new employment standards, et cetera. Labor Louis says, look how great things are in the socialist utopia of Saskatchewan. Uh, obviously I'm exaggerating for effect. Uh, and um, you should vote CCF. And this is an interesting campaign that actually uh, made its way into the sort of work newspapers of pretty much every major CCL union uh, in 1948, 49, during these crucial moments in time. Now, I think that the Douglas cabinet was keen and interested in this project. It wasn't something they just didn't want to do and they were doing just out of the goodness of their hearts for the national party. And I think while some of his cabinet was quite reluctant, in fact, some of his most radical members of his cabinet were uh, rural members 
uh, who you know were keen to use the state to protect farmers to build up the local economy, uh, but were also not super eager to promote the rights of labor above and beyond the rights of farmers. And Douglas, I think, was able through his sheer force of political will with inside his cabinet to say no, no socialist government worthy of that name could or should exist without a forward thinking labor relations code. And we know I've found documentation that shows that, um, you know, him writing that. And it had to promote certain things. It had to promote collective bargaining. It had to promote a legal framework to organize. And it had to promote a legal right uh, to strike. And all of that had to be administered through some sort of institution uh, that, um, you know, was not the courts. And that ends up being the Saskatchewan Labor Relations Board. None of this is radical in the context it was happening elsewhere. But there was an interesting CCF spin on it that's worth sort of highlighting. The bill uh, also has several recognizable features. Uh, that don't exist in other jurisdictions. So one is section four of the 44 Act, which says company unions are illegal. No other bill in Saskatchewan had, or sorry, in Canada had done that up until that point. PC 1003 refused to outlaw company unions. The Ontario Act refused to outlaw company unions. The BC Act did the same. Only Saskatchewan said no company unions. And I think looking back in 2020, that doesn't seem radical. But in 1944, it was because during the war, because it was so difficult for capital to freely fire people, there was less of a reserve army of the unemployed. The sheer anti-avoidance strategy of capital in the 1940s was a company union to break the back of the industrial unions coming forward. Um, so that was a big deal for the labor movement and PC-1003 did not outlaw company unions. The bill also gave the labor board real independence and real power, two things that were lacking in the Federal Labor Relations Board. The board had the power to enforce its order through the courts. A decision of the board was the equivalent of a decision from the court of King's Bench at those days. Uh, it was enforceable as a judgment of the court. That wasn't actually true anywhere else. And it ends up being, that part ends up being litigated to death by capital to try and weaken the board and they're ultimately unsuccessful. Uh, the board could determine appropriate bargain units, the board could determine which unions represent employees, and the board had a list in the act of unfair labor practices which were quite extensive. And as Bruin said in a letter to Douglas, you know, most of the unfair labor practices could only really be achieved by capital, not by labor. Labor's at a disadvantage. Unfair labor practices are only really done by business, not by labor. Employers couldn't threaten to fire the union. Uh, organizers, the employers couldn't threaten to move operations to avoid union organizing or to defeat a strike. There was numerous and extensive penalties for engaging in an unfair labor practice. Um, Section 13 of the Act gave the labor or the lieutenant governor and council the power to appoint a controller. This to me is probably one of the most radical uh, parts of the Act that I think if we really wanted to, to rattle some chains uh, coming to power in Saskatchewan today, we could just introduce this part of the act and businesses would lose their mind. Um, what, um, what, uh, what the act does in section 13 is it essentially allows the government to take over a plant that refuses to abide by an order of the board uh, based on an unfair labor practice. In other words, the government can nationalize an industry if the uh, business refuses to engage in fair bargaining with the union. Uh, this eventually gets erased by the Liberal government in the 1960s, but in my opinion, this is by far the most radical component of the act. Uh, this, uh, as you can see from this picture from the Regina Leader Post, uh, this is what um, they define as the sharp teeth in the Labor Relations Act. I mean, it gives the act real, real power. Um, and that was true nowhere else in the country. Conciliation is not mandatory before strikes. Everywhere else, conciliation is mandatory. Conciliation, as many scholars have pointed out, is a delaying tactic that's often used by business to try and weaken the ability of workers to picket. The act also legalizes mandatory dues collection and something called maintenance of membership provisions, which is a form of union security that doesn't exist anywhere else in the act as well. Um, new units would be determined in the case of a vote by 25%, so a pretty low threshold, or by a majority of cards signed by the workers and you know the union could then be certified by the board without a vote. As many people who study labor today know, um, you know, there's, um, that's become rarer as uh, right-wing governments have pushed mandatory votes, which is of course designed to weaken and undermine 
the ability to organize. There's no other reason for it. All the research shows that when you include a mandatory vote, unionization goes down. Um, we found a lot of really interesting letters back and forth between different forms of unions to uh, look at some of the gendered implications of this. Some of this is hard to di dissect because you know there wasn't a lot of discussion about gender. Uh, but where there was, what we do see is that both in the TLC and the CCL unions, there was very little interest in organizing women workers. Um, in fact, Douglas, we found a series of letters from T TLC locals in um, Moose Jaw, Regina, and Saskatoon who were quite upset at some of the women personnel that were hired uh, by the Douglas cabinet to help with labor policy and to sit on the board. Um, so what we see is that this model of organizing and this model of labor policy was really designed in the role of, of promoting male industrial working class organizing. Uh, it had very little implications and it wasn't very far forward thinking when it came to the areas of the economy where women were working, in this case primarily um, uh, you know, on the farm uh, and in retail and in low wage sort of precarious work uh, you know, in sort of department stores and other places. The way Douglas gets this bill through without cabinet opposition is by not letting it apply to the family farm. And you know, as we saw in Alberta, when the Notley government tried to bring in even moderate reforms uh, to labor standards in farming communities, the farming communities lose their mind, right? And the, that was the way they were able to compromise with some of them, even the more radical members of his cabinet in any other way. Um, you know, guys like Joe Phelps, who were against this, but was you know, equally happy to use the state to try and organize um, you know, to try and nationalize various things, uh, was pretty anti-labor. In fact, when Phelps is defeated in 48, uh, he blames the Labor Act for the reason why rural communities were turning against him. Um, but, you know, it's an incredible success story, this act, in terms of getting people into unions, at least initially. So you can see this is the level of unionization. I don't know if you can see it with, depending on how you organize your pictures here. Um, sorry, uh, you know, up until the 1944, essentially, unionization in Saskatchewan is pretty low. It's one of the lowest in the country. The only province in Canada uh, is, that's lower is PEI. After 44, unionization explodes in Saskatchewan, and it, it's tied to the act. There's no other way to just define it. It does even out by the 1960s, and I think that's an interesting question, and Andrew and I are sort of kind of exploring as to why. But um, you know that initial stage when that act is passed. I mean, you see workers by the thousands joining uh, heretofore unheard of unionization across the province. So these graphs, I think, really show, and you see that you know there uh, there's um, you know just an increase in union membership, and you kind of see that there. Um, the real prize for the TLC, and how's my time, by the way? Sorry, am I running out of time? Yeah, it's time to wrap it up. It's time to wrap it up. Okay, well. I can do that then. Um, so this the section that you know you think we see in another part is that people were complaining the right was complaining that this will lead to an increase in strikes. Um, not really. I mean that graph is uh, somewhat dubious because you know you go from four strikes to sixteen during the year, but it kind of levels out after 1950 and never really explodes. Um, and I'll just end end on this. <clears throat> One of the questions that you know we keep coming back to is. Um, you know, what's the, what's the relationship between a socialist government or a social democratic government and the unions? And one of the histories of this period is once the act is passed, the Douglas government sees the act as the prize. Labor should be happy, don't complain. But when they go into bargaining, uh, you know, there's a lot of tension between these two entities. And the problem is, is that the government was looking out for the province as a whole and didn't see its role as you know, giving up anything and bargaining to the unions and the unions are trying to play catch up. So there's lots of tension. And you know, this is, I think, interesting given that we're trying to think about the ways the state can promote unionization in 2020 and we're seeing that with places like Uber and Fedora, et cetera, et cetera. It's so worth thinking about the tensions and contradictions and ending on a quote from Douglas might be the most appropriate the principal issue, he says, is the challenge which is being continuously down by the unions as to whether the employees, and here he's talking about a, a strike in the government insurance office, 
or any other worker can in its effect decide whether the government can maintain its services. There's only one answer to this question. The citizens of Saskatchewan, including the members of the trade unions, can govern through their elected representatives in no other way. We must categorically state, however, that there can be no opportunity for any group to use their economic or political power to establish a favored position among their fellows except by the consent of the community as a whole expressed through their democratic franchise. And what Douglas is essentially saying there is that, listen, we've given you this great act. We don't really want you to use it. And I find that tension and contradiction really fascinating in the relationship between a progressive government on the one hand and a fighting working class on the other. So I'll end there uh, and look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Charles. Um, I'll just get you to stop sharing your screen when you have a second. And um, I'm the last speaker and we've got about half an hour left. So I'm going to try and take just sort of 10 or 15 minutes to talk to you a little bit about the labor process under living skies. I have some slides. I think at the beginning when we were having a casual conversation, I said I had redrafted this presentation four times in the last week. Um, partly because it's related to COVID and what's happening, but also partly because it's very much a work in progress and the thoughts are sort of uh, just evolving. So I want to do this very carefully. Um, and tell you which one of these we're gonna share. Okay. So, can you see just the slide, the title slide, Labor Process Under Living Skies? Is that what you guys can see? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I'm doing, Living Skies, for those of you who don't know, is the slogan on the Saskatchewan license plate. And I'm very interested in extending the research that I do on professionals to explore what's happening with their labor process and how perhaps regions have an impact on that, particularly as we see a greater move um, or increasingly a move toward uh, consolidation of practice, uh, cross jurisdiction movement of professional workers internationally as well as within Canada and a, sort of um, an institutional isomorphism to, to some extent and great pressure towards that. And so much of my work examines the legal profession uh, among other professions. And the reason I want to talk about this today and why I think it's important is for a number of reasons. This profession is a gatekeeper. It's a gatekeeper for much of what transpires in civil society. It is also pivotal in um, ensuring access to justice for citizens in the country and in Saskatchewan in particular. And as one of the three traditional liberal professions, it sets an example, sometimes to be avoided, but sometimes to be emulated. And I'm struck um, this week in particular by the headlines that involve reopening uh, as a result of uh, public policy shifts in response to the pandemic. We are reopening, but we are looking to other jurisdictions to see what's working and what is not. So in this sense, I, um, I've been doing some comparative research between what's happening in the legal profession in Saskatchewan, particularly I started out looking at the regulatory framework and then uh, examining some of the other jurisdictions in Canada, paying more attention now to what's going on in Ontario. So one of the questions that I'm fascinated with is to what extent will those who get it right keep it in place? And Saskatchewan's been quite fortunate in um, the exercise of its social distancing response um, in that our uh, fatalities due to the pandemic are relatively low compared to uh, the rest of the country and our incidence of infection um, are also relatively low compared to other jurisdictions and our testing rates seem to be keeping pace with uh, sort of the national norm. So is this a space that is getting it right? And have the changes that have been implemented in the way legal work in particular is undertaken? Will those changes last? So there's been much discussion about uh, the digitization of work overall, uh, some of it leading to gig work. And uh, one of the things that I've said at these conferences in the past is that, um, and I said just about an hour and a half ago in another session, is that uh, legal work is the ultimate gig work. 
and professional work is gig work. It's case by case, file by file, diagnosis by diagnosis, if you will. And as a result, the labor process, to some extent, resists um, Braverman's sort of embodiment of knowledge and technique in the machinery. And that's because it's a knowledge work. It's an intellectual pursuit. At the heart of both professional identity and the professional labor process is the exercise of professional discretion. It is taking a confined body of knowledge with specific boundaries around it, controlled by the profession, and that's at the heart of defining a profession. It's taking that knowledge and being able to apply something that is codified to the unique situation presented in this particular problem or presented by this particular client. And what we've seen in terms of digitization in the profession is the codified body of knowledge is now readily accessible. So from one perspective, there's not very much of a role um, for capital in the professional labor process. Traditionally, you have a sole practitioner um, or a very small labor practice where everyone was a partner and therefore they were owner operators and, and you didn't have um, an investment in the same way in capital, in machinery and so on. The big investment in a law firm is the library. And that's gone the way of Google, right? Uh, those huge compendium uh, resources are now digitized. And for the effort of getting a library card, you too can have access to all the case law, all the analysis, all the arbitration decisions. Much of that is actually um, available publicly, even without the library card. So um, professionals are a unique group in this in this sense. And and I mean Braverman has. Um, and, and others in, the criti in critical management studies have told us that um, uh, labor process theory is dead or dying, that we're not really interested anymore in understanding or exploring the ways in which um, an employer commands and controls and fragments the work, reducing its meaning and reducing the discretion of the individual practitioner. I'm arguing that professions are different. And the legal profession in particular is a really interesting example that may shed some insight um, in terms of what might lie ahead for other groups, professional groups, semi-professional groups, and knowledge workers more generally. And that's because the legal profession exists in an interesting ecosystem, which um, has four key uh, players, if you will, that are defining the rules and regulations, the courts, the legislature crafting the laws themselves, associations which are advocacy groups, and the regulatory body, which is typically called the law society, although the name actually varies um, across the country a little bit. And then of course you have all the individual members. And uh, the work takes place in a law office, but for those of you who might know as much about this as I do, I obsess about this a little bit, the workplace is not regulated. What is regulated in the legal profession is the legal worker, the lawyer. And so all the legislation, all the directives and so on and so forth are uh, regulating the practice of law in terms of what the individual does. And it's really difficult to separate what the worker does from who the worker is. There are some things that lawyers can do in this jurisdiction and across Canada that they are able to do as a citizen, as a professional, as a worker, simply by virtue of the fact that they are a lawyer. Things that nobody else can do. Sometimes there are some things that uh, they can do that also a minister of a church can do, and that harkens back to the classic liberal professions of the clergy, medicine, and law. Um, but their identity is tied very, very closely to their practice. So the labor process is takes place within the individual and that persists. It's advice that's given in interpreting what's best for you in your situation. And that's at the heart of what lawyers do. So what has COVID meant in terms of total disruption of our regular work practices and our regular work sites? Well, legal work, the legal profession was deemed an essential service. 
largely because it provides access to justice and that's not to be jeopardized. However, there is uh, an incredibly sensitive human element to this labor process, and that is that you meet with your lawyer. Now, a lot of work takes place over the telephone, but there's a real ritual involved in going to the lawyer's office, in signing documents, and the legislation actually is quite restrictive in Canada, requiring certain documents to be witnessed, quote, in wet ink. And I don't use wet ink um, very much anymore, but the notion is that you are signing and witnessing someone's commitment while you're physically sharing the space with them and you sign directly underneath. And this is important in contract law and um, in family law, in wills and estates and so on. So one of the things I was interested to find out is whether innovation, which has been very, very slow to take root in the legal profession, will push the legal profession to go what I call face-free. Um, whether what we'll see um, are small and nimble firms and small and nimble jurisdictions being able to move very quickly to innovate and adapt, or whether we'll see more of a play of resource dependency theory where the large powerful institutions and jurisdictions will move much more quickly to adapt. Are we going to see institutional isomorphism across Canada where all the courts do the same thing and the practitioners respond in a similar way? Or are we going to see new ways of working emerge? Will we see alternate dispute resolution really take off and, and rise to the fore as an option um, for individuals in conflict where um, the courts are restricting um, not only what they're dealing with, which, which cases they're dealing with, but also elements within cases. So uh, the courts are pushing more and more matters that they traditionally heard and heard in person uh, back to legal counsel to resolve between the parties and they're using what precious time they have to only hear substantive and not procedural matters in the courthouse. The, the profession is notoriously slow to change and um, writing over a decade ago, Richard Susskind in the UK, he wrote The End of Lawyers. And he predicted mass digitization and commoditization of legal work. And it hasn't come to pass. And it is it's slowly, we're nibbling around the edges. Um, Ryerson University in Toronto has the Legal Innovation Zone where we're seeing some um, sort of incubator startup, basically technology firms trying to help automate, digitize and take advantage of big data in the legal profession. But it hasn't changed because it's a monopoly. And that's at the heart of the definition of a profession as well. You create a market monopoly. And there is very little incentive to change. So is it possible that um, using uh, Valerie Vezina's work in her book, Une Nation, she argues that places like Saskatchewan are essentially islands that they are insular. And she examines this on four dimensions, one of which is territory and the difficulty there is in traveling from your, your location to other locations, but also to central locations of power. And that extends to the political, how far you are physically and also emotionally and tacitly from central decision-making. And to what extent is your economic structure interdependent on other regions or is it fairly independent? And finally, on the cultural dimension, do your stories and your history reflect a hardship that is unique to your physical space? And so she argues that on these dimensions, Saskatchewan very much is an island. So it's an island that will draw on its own uh, resources and thus will be able to innovate. And Charles, this is just beautifully positioned, Charles has illustrated how that happened with legislation in the 40s, um, that why, some, some of the reasons why innovation um, in that respect was possible. However, um, and, and the legal profession is provincially regulated um, in Canada, but there is a, a increasingly pressure to uh, standardize, if you will, and there's greater and greater mobility across um, provincial boundaries as the clients expand across provincial boundaries. So if you have operations in Alberta and in Saskatchewan, if you're um, FCL and you're running 
distribution points and refinery operations in a couple of different provinces and your legal counsel to that firm, to that cooperative, you would need to be um, called to the bar in both provinces in order to be able to provide advice. And that's changing. That, that's no longer the extent. That's no longer the, the situation rather. So um, just to sort of cut to the chase um, and, and drawing on both blogs and interviews and case study of a particular firm in um, Ontario and emerging reflections and, and direction um, that coming from associations and the various law societies, a couple of things are um, really being made clear. And the, the one example I want to draw on in, the, in just the last couple of minutes is this notion of requiring a signature in wet ink. And the law says that you have to witness contracts, you have to witness wills in particular in wet ink. And what we've seen is that jurisdictions have rewritten their statutes. And Saskatchewan was quick to respond in this regard to provide the ability for signatures to be witnessed through Zoom technology. So I can, you know, hold up for those of you who have my, my picture still running, you know, I can hold up the piece of paper and I can sign it in front of you and then take a photograph. You can watch me take the photograph. I can email it to you. You can print it out as my lawyer and you can sign it. And that's now an acceptable way to proceed. I could also walk downtown and stand outside your office and sign it on the window and that kind of thing. What's interesting is that the statute says only in cases of provincial emergency or where a national emergency has been declared. So yes, we're going to change and we see that this is important, but it's only temporary. And we're going to go back to the way things were uh, when the state of emergency is, is over. So, so COVID is a wonderful opportunity to examine how these big institutions change and whether or not um, a regional feature is going to lead us to some interesting innovation. So far, no. Despite the fact that superior court judges in Ontario, for example, have been quoted as saying, uh, the courts will never be the same again. We're never going to go back to the way things were. Um, we're, we're just finally seeing the revolution and in innovation that we predicted long ago. I have my doubts. And that is because a case study that I'm working on with Spring Law is a firm that um, only deals uh, at, at a distance with their clients. They never meet in person. They never appear in tribunal forums. They, they, are a, they practice employer side and employee side labor law. Uh, the employee side is usually with senior executives and they um, never meet with people. They're a totally virtual firm. Their employees are scattered across the province and they have a one touch data management system where they all share all the files. They're really uh, the exemplar of the modern law firm, if you will. And they've seen a real uptick in um, business because people are becoming more comfortable with this remote technology. But they have operated on the fringes and they have redefined their labor process to exclude certain aspects of the traditional firm. So they have resisted by redefining their labor process. And um, my hypothesis is that we're not going to see dramatic change in the fundamental labor process and the legal profession um, because despite nimbleness in regions and so on, um, there just is not a will to shift away from monopoly control. What drives innovation at the end of the day is competition and public policy on healthcare, on education, on dealing with COVID is going to outstrip any desire to change any of the regulatory frameworks around the legal profession. And I think that's really too bad. I'm reminded of the Tom Wayman poem that I read to my students every semester, uh, the title of which is, Did I Miss Anything? It encourages students to come to class. Um, and this was one opportunity to really make a difference and to really have a social impact, particularly in terms of access to justice. And we didn't take it. And I will end that there and we can turn ourselves over to some discussion. And I think there's things, um, oh, sorry, there were some problems with the slides. Right, okay. It was fine, we could see it's it. It's okay, it's over. We can now talk about other and interesting things.
So it's a small group. Um, and I think if you, um, you can raise your hand, you can post a question in the group chat, or you can simply turn on your video and wave, and I will moderate um, questions. And Dion has her blue hand up. Go ahead, Dion, with your question. Hi, so this present, all, the, all of the presentations made me incredibly homesick. So, and, and I just want to say it's, it's awesome that there's a session at ILEAR on Saskatchewan. Um, and I think actually, um, I want to ask a question that kind of ties together all three presentations, because I think Saskatchewan is a really unique kind of context. And I think to Sheila's point about sort of this, like, it's really removed this island concept or imaginary of the place. And then Charles, um, great history. Which I didn't know, I love that Labour Louis thing. I didn't know um, a lot of that about the CCF and I've read a lot about the CCF. So it has this like really sort of long history that actually is like as close to sort of socialism or communism that you could kind of get in this country in terms of the political backstory and the co-op movement and the union movement were really involved and, and the farmers as well early on in all of that. And then come sort of forward to what Andrew is sort of talking about. You know, one of the, the things that I've always thought about and I would just love your thoughts on it is that you know, I feel like Saskatchewan does not fit into the classic narratives that sort of, you know, like that sort of come out from the labor movement these days or that come out from management side. Like, even, you know, so I'm just wondering about your thoughts about that, because it, it sort of seems to me like it requires really nuanced kind of understanding. Like, so if I take sort of the, the sort of co-op refinery lockout as a great example. So you know, Scott Banda and many of the senior executives were very involved in the progressive like movement in Saskatchewan in the NDP party, right? Scott Banda ran for leadership of the NDP. And so I think like it's, you know, in some ways, like these are not people who are opposed to labor, right? They're not people who are like, they're very, very big fans of the CCF. And like, if you read sort of Seymour Lipset stuff about Saskatchewan, right? There's always been these tensions, right? With the sort of the farmers and the, and the co-op and the workers. And the co-op is also not a worker co-op, right? It's, a cons it's, it's owned by consumers. And so it's a different governance structure than a worker co-op. So anyways, I'm just, I know some of this is just rambling all over the place, but to me, it's like there's something deeper here than just sort of the classic kind of you know, kind of stories. And I'm just wondering if you agree with that or if you think it actually still fits very much into sort of like the broader neoliberal debate and the broader sort of corporatization debate because I just don't see it like that. And maybe it's because I'm biased because I grew up there and I love it and I want it to be unique, <laughs> you know, but it just seems, it just seems like there's something more. Um, and I think it came out from the three of your presentations together, you know, that there's this complexity and nuance there. Anyway, I'll stop talking and let you answer. Maybe we'll tackle that. Thank you, Dion. We'll tackle it um, through across the panel. So Andrew Charles, you know, respond to Dion's comment and I might weigh in at the end. Uh, you want to start, Andrew? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, that's, that's a good point. So I, I would say that we might be able to define what's happening now on the ground in terms of sets of contradictions. Might be one approach. I agree. There's There's a there's a history of the co-op movement, um, not necessarily workers, but uh, farmers. There's the culture there. And I think what's unique about the CRC 594 debate is you'd never see a company like Walmart. You'd never seen Irving refineries. You'd never see a lot, a lot of those large uh, refineries in Canada ever talking about solidarity, equality, and cooperation as part of their, in a, in a meaningful sense, as part of their business model. So I do find it's loaded with contradictions. So at the same time as, you know, the FCL and the co-op refinery complex talk about their commitment to internationally accepted standards of cooperation, they're holding rallies in Carsland, Alberta with United We Roll, the far right, Yellow Vests and others. And I think they were able to secure a lot of popular support against Unifor because one, they cast Unifor as an Eastern based union that was attacking the values of, uh, of agrarian collectivism and cooperation, even though I think that exists on paper. And in reality, you think those principles don't exist in the same way. 
So yeah, it is unique. I mean, we wouldn't see this unfold and it became part of a public relations, communications and labor relations strategy, at least on, on the ground level. And you're right, it's not without some irony that Scott Banda had long been a staple of the NDP trying to seek leadership. They now bank on the SAS party, right? So I, I think that that cooperative history, I think in some respects, at least at, that at the higher level, has been forfeited in exchange for functioning like in real terms, like every other uh, enterprise in that industry. So I, I think part of that is drawing from the imagination that was Saskatchewan. And in reality now, I, I think they've departed from it quite substantially. Charles? So there's also really, con like, and by the way, before I go on, I'm getting some work done on my house. So apologies for the nail gun going off out front. Um, but I think Saskatchewan itself, like Sheila said, the island concept is interesting, but it's also a, a real contradiction in terms of its political economy. So for the CCF to win in 44, they had to align with farmer interests, right? It would have been impossible to win otherwise. Uh, and, you know, as uh, John Conway has shown in his book, just recently published on the former leader, jo George Harrow Williams of the CCF prior to Douglas coming over, is that the party itself in Saskatchewan had actually started moving quite significantly to the right, away from the more radical labor socialism coming out in the 1930s in order to win that alliance. And Lipset even says this, right? That farmers are fair weather fair weather friends to the CCF that by 48 when the farm economy starts to improve they move away from you know co-ops and socialism uh, to you know sort of more me first kind of free marketism because the economy had improved so much for farmers and they start losing support in rural in rural Saskatchewan and I think that that trend has continued uh, and it and it's always been that tension with the farming class in Saskatchewan that's made progressive politics difficult here. Had the CCF won power in BC, where it was the most Marxist, it was an actual Marxist party within the CCF. They were always on the outlier of the National Party. Had they won in BC, they would have been, I think, pushed a lot farther on some of these reforms. But interesting, in and in, this is an ancient contradiction, in Saskatchewan, there isn't an organized capitalist class to push back against Douglas from doing these things. In British Columbia, there would have been. In Ontario, there would have been, right? So they didn't have the opposition. Like there's a Prairie Canadian Manufacturers Association, but as far as I can tell, and I've been trying to dig through the historical record, they all were in Manitoba and Winnipeg, and they would write the odd letter complaining about the Labor Relations Act, but they didn't have a sustained organization to oppose it until the 60s. So it's this weird contradiction. And I like the island idea because it really is this unique place that because of its contradictions, I think the history tells us so much about why Saskatchewan has this unique history and why today that contradiction is different because it is much more diversified than even Alberta. So the SAS party is able to rule as a traditional right-wing party in alliance with the traditional capitalist class that is much more like Ontario or BC than it was in the 40s. Um, and of course that farmer wing is still powerful, although it's much different, right? Because now we're talking about not family farmers, we're talking about huge conglomerate agro capital businesses uh, that have millions of dollars in assets and million dollars in liabilities. And uh, it's a much different dynamic. And then Andrew's point about, and Sheila's point about the oil sector and about how this is all working really has changed the dynamic of the place. And again, that's interesting for me because you're from here, Dayon, I'm not. I've only been here since 2010, so I'm really as an outsider looking in, trying to understand the place and look at it through like that lens of, you know, the big question guiding our research really is like, what does a left wing party do to help labor when it gets elected? And there's just not many instances in North America of that actually ever happening. So Saskatchewan gives us that unique insight to sort of what it means to build a labor movement through the state. Anyway, I'm rambling too, so I'll, I'll stop there. The only thing I would add is that, um... I think maybe a study of professions uh, looks at the other end of the scale. It's a study of elites in lots of ways. Uh, the people in the profession are uh, the elite among workers and their clientele are elites as well. So those who are um, providing services to organizations are, um, are dealing with sort of an elite client relationship and uh, access to justice for the common person um, 
at the common immigrant English as an additional language individual, you know, having trouble finding work and so on is just not not even on the radar. Uh, and, and so Saskatchewan was able Saskatchewan does regulate law firms, you know, it's a small entity, everybody kind of knows each other in the profession and they're very nimble. And they're one of the few provinces that has actually started to regulate the firm as a workplace in addition to regulating lawyers. What's interesting is that when you're faced with a crisis, you tend to go back to your learned behaviors, right? You go back to your training, you go back to your inculcation, your, your apprenticeship. And Saskatchewan could be a leader in lots of ways. Before COVID shut down, my interviewees were talking about blockchain technology and artificial intelligence and controlling contracts remotely and all of this really interesting stuff. And now they're talking about signing wills in wet ink, you know, so they're, um, they've had to retrench. And uh, so, so Saskatchewan can be a leader. Um, it can kind of trade on that, that history and that cachet. Um, but I'm not convinced that in the face of these big systemic and national challenges, it's actually going to be able to. Yeah, it might be actually less of an island if it's more interconnected and that restricts its capacity to innovate. Don't know, it's ongoing work. Um, I wonder in the last 10 seconds that remain or a minute or so, if anybody else had any questions. No, but I would love to stop the recording and keep uh, the conversation going. <laughs> this is the drawback to the um, the virtual conference is we can't now go down the hallway um, to the pub or to the coffee shop and have you know um, an ongoing conversation. We could do it through email, separate Zoom sessions, but um, we it would be great if there was a drop-in coffee space. Um, I can. Uh... I can stop the recording now if everybody's happy with that. You need this space though, don't you, Gunther, to uh, to host another session? Uh, I think I'm done for today. So um, so uh, let me just uh, stop it now then. And then uh, that should, uh, it, it's recording on the cloud, so it should send a signal to stop it.